So, when I think about executive functioning again, I can think about an example of, of myself with my own kitchen, which I don't have right now. So if I had my own kitchen, I would have my kitchen items everywhere in the cupboards. Um, I'd have to organize that. I kind of have to know where that is. That all takes up a certain amount of space in the brain or capacity. And then I would need to go grocery shopping several times a week and I'd have to know what's in the fridge and I'd have to know how to recombine them to make certain items of food. I'd have to know when they run out. I'd have to make a list. I'd have to put it in my phone. Um, so many different things. So the whole process of having one's own kitchen takes up a lot of executive functioning. It takes organizing and planning, which is what this study um, pointed to as part of executive function. So just having one's own kitchen takes a lot of organizing and planning. Now, it doesn't take that much organizing and planning if one is already out and about during the day, because one is never home, um, to go to a restaurant, you know, grab a booster juice. That doesn't take that much. You can just see the booster juice and go get them and they'll do all the organizing of everything. All you have to do is walk in and give them your money. So you do have to have money, um, some bit of money for sure, but it doesn't require as much organizing and planning. And so I've been spending more money on food because going out to get it made for you is more expensive than making it yourself. But the organizing and planning of making it yourself is more expensive in terms of the energy of executive functioning. So what I before probably would have said, you know, going to restaurants every day is bad. But I think, um, I think part of executive functioning is what would be um, the judge, you know, thinker, thinking I should be doing this, I should be doing that, judging this, I'm this, I am that. And when energy isn't being wasted in that, and one's just like, okay, I'm hungry, I'm gonna get food. Um, simple thing. Then one's not gonna die, so then what do you have to be, what does one have to be afraid of? So, um, Realizing, hey, if I'm not super organized, I'm not going to starve. And then somebody who's homeless, they're usually probably able to get some food by the means that they do. Um, so what I'm saying is right now, by virtue of my own living environment, my executive functioning isn't being as stimulated by something like a kitchen. But I'm not in fear of my life because I can go get food. Uh, it's more expensive, but it's cheaper in ways in that it doesn't take up so much brain capacity. Now imagine if I met somebody who wanted to start a little community with me, like two people, and they loved making raw vegan food or something, um, living food, then they would be putting energy into doing what they love and then they could perhaps feed me and I could do what I love and write and make new memes. So the thing with the recovery movement and if one has a mental health issue diagnosed, they're like, well, now you gotta figure out how to do everything by yourself. And I think that's part of the structure of the world, you know, besides people making new family units, that is wrong. Like we're more designed to live in community. And I think one thing that's happening with bipolar is that one is seeing the, um, like the futility of some family systems. Just because we were born into a certain family doesn't mean we're meant to live and die by that conditioning. And I think some of us are sensing that it's toxic for us and it doesn't mean that we need to be alone forever because we're rejected by our family. But maybe we need to go find um, co-creative brains, um, people who like to fulfill certain roles of, this person makes the healthy food. I can make healthy food if I have the right tools and I have access to healthy food. I'm, I like to make, I used to like to make raw vegan food. Um, so everybody doing their own executive functioning to take care of their life, like mostly themselves and with the help of mental health if they have a label, 
um, is a big waste of energy versus de designing some kind of co-creative swarm or super organism community. And um, yeah, I can go live as a dysfunctional family member um, in a basement, or I can go out and create a new type of family co-creative scaffolding. And maybe it's not possible, but I think that we need to move past sacrificing who we are born to be for the sake of who family members think we should be. And if we realize that we're caught in that, um, just cut off that attachment. And um, yeah, I found a sheet of paper. I was looking through some of my papers and I organized them somewhat and it didn't take as long as I thought. And I found a little pile of things I might talk about, but the rest of them, there's a lot of good information there that would be fun to go through with somebody one day, but it's more like filed in the background now. And um, I did find a sheet of paper with the seven S's of co-creation by Barbara Marks Hubbard. And I got her book, I got a book called Conscious Evolution or something by her on Kindle. We'll see if I read some of it. But the seven S's, which I'll talk about more later, because I have the sheet at home, they're syntony, synergy, synchronicity, syntropy, spontaneity, self-creativity. I think these probably are characteristics of, of mania. You know, and I don't want to keep calling it mania. I think it could probably more likely be called co-creation when it's shared because mania is the process of keeping the energy to oneself and building a self and maybe turning hedonic whereas um, if one grabs the memes but doesn't do the behaviors prematurely then one shares it it's part of co-creation and since it is so much energy and it's the energy of non-separation -separ it is meant to be shared because um, there is nothing that we cannot share and then I found some words I wrote down for myself. I made up the word transfer mystic, transfer magic. And today I made up the word transfer meme because there are these memes that can uh, transform us. They're new memes and they're possibly memes that would give rise to different gestures, not based on the self. So I think what happens in mania is that the energy gets turn into self gestures a lot of the times um, which is part of the mechanism you know um, it's part of the mechanism of if you, keep, if you keep this energy for yourself and you act in ways just to fulfill yourself with this energy it's just gonna implode and you're gonna feel like shit and you're going to have a, a low as low as the high you just had so there is a mechanism in it that will destroy the self um, or it will share in co-creation and I think um, this time around not doing anything that would really be a gesture of the self or even writing down any plans or ideas last time I had this energy um, it's allowed that self to to atrophy to shrink down so um, so now if that energy comes back, it might not move in the ways of the self so much. Oh, and I kind of added the word serendipity because it starts with an S. I don't know if that one... Yeah, I think I like the word serendipity. The eight S's of co-creation because I think mania can have to do with serendipity and then one needs to share those memes. So serendipity is part of the meme extraction process. So yeah, I think that's the mistake we make, is we act based on that energy 
and it's so different. So we're acting so different than other people. So we might have to be able to harvest these memes and have this understanding, but we can't fully act and celebrate in that way. It's so quiet here in the park. I just went for a walk around the park loop and the pharmacy called me and told me that they can't get any Nazanin. They can't order it. So, so much for that, for a possible strategy for sleep. So they are gonna fax my GP and see if there's anything else that they recommend. Otherwise, I do still have quite a bit of Zoplicone left, which is good. But I might be a little bit addicted to it, but that's okay. And um, I want to keep talking for a bit since it seems that I'm in the mood to do so. And um, I made another note about executive function that it's the current mode of it is based on separation. It's based on the notion of a separate self. And really there's no separate self it's one consciousness so we may have separate bodies but it's one human consciousness it's not separate consciousness that came into being on their own we were given this human consciousness we were conditioned with it and i wrote down again one of my favorite questions by krishna murti when he asked, is it possible for human beings to bring about a totally different category or dimension of the mind? And I think that's what's partly happening in mania. So when that happens, it's partly our job to help make that category or dimension available to others. So they might not be thrust into the energy of that. Not everyone will, but some people will, and they can bring back the memes and share it such that it gets embodied. Those memes, those vibrations, those memes, they're encoded with meaning and those meanings change the brain. And those, when the brain changes the way we function and operate and gesture and move and relate and interact, uh, changes. And I wrote down a bunch of words here from a little, um, mind map that I made. Well, it's a big mind map, sort of. And I have it posted on my wall. And I was thinking about how oftentimes in, in recovery, they might give us a pie chart and be like, well, rate your pie. And they might have like eight sections. And they'll say like, rate it from one to 10 in the center. Like, um, like health, uh, family, relationships, work, um, mental health, blah, blah, whatever. And so when I did this mind map, it sort of reminds me of how limited that pie chart is that they might give out for us to fill in. And to me, these might be more of the sections of the pie of a, a, a bipolar brain than those basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs type sections. So here are some of the words. Subjective, objective, learning, dialogue, meaning, perspectives, possibilities, sound, vibration, energy, consciousness, human potential, flow, dreamscape, creativity, spirituality, potential, hum humility, altruism, oxytocin, intelligence, swarm, super organism, resources, nature of reality, quantum physics, sharing, wellness, love, questioning, fun, laughter, celebration, nutrition, values, traits, lifestyle, scaffolding, lifestyle design, wandering, wondering, divergent thinking, lateral thinking, um, I would add manic thinking, and memes, function, motive, ubermensch, harvest, 
harness, practice, experiment, embody, perception, insight, action, inspiration, genius, nature, oneness, participate, beauty, strangers, phenomena, and I would add gestures. So that's a lot more pieces of the puzzle than these little dimensions that were told are are the big pieces of life and at some point I want to put together some sparks for the bipolar brain um, meaning it's kind of like combustion it's like the fuel um, like the brain is fueled by inspiration and so showing some like inspirational YouTube clips or things like that can provide some fuel to spark the brain which gives it access to a higher vibration and then it can go into sort of thinking for itself and creating for itself. So I think, for example, people with low executive functioning or executive function, however you say it. So if someone with bipolar had low executive function, they might get like an occupational therapist and a rec therapist to, you know, show them through the motions of cleaning and cooking and all that. Or you could just give a string of inspirational YouTube videos and that person's brain will be sparked into a higher level of functioning than that. It needs inspiration and then the life that we're given after a diagnosis is not very inspirational so it doesn't provide the fuel and then also the medications they're they're tranquilizers they're not they're not medicines they're not fixing some kind of chemical imbalance they're just tranquilizing us and I'm not saying I'm against that I think to tranquilize oneself so one can sleep at night is important actually if that's the way it has to happen for a while at least and for me, since I was able to come off all medications for five months, I don't think, and I was able to sleep and do everything fine, um, I don't think, at least I know that it's possible that I don't have to take it at some time. But it's not necessarily the ultimate goal. It's more inspirational to think and harvest new memes, and it seems that if one exercises that aspect of the brain, then one can have access to it at any time. It's possible that part of the reason why I'm able to have the energy come back, even though I'm taking medications, is that I've fully exercised this part of my brain that thinks for itself. So I can go back into that, and that provides fuel to see more and more and continue this communication with myself. And and also, when that study was talking about memory, I'm thinking that memory, like personal psychological memories, are going to be less and less important. They're not very important. And if we base the way we operate on personal psychological memories, then uh, what's going to happen is there's going to be more and more Alzheimer's people not functioning because they don't have their personal psychological memories. But the thing is, life isn't personal and there is no self. So when that self is starting to get erased, those psychological memories, it's just erasing a structure that is false and illusion. But the trouble is when we have been trained to operate only with that way of being then we're in trouble because if our our personal memories which is part of the cognition starts to go then we can't even take care of ourselves we can't do anything so um, those same types of behaviors and necessary actions of personal care can be restructured in the brain and rewired in the brain in a different way that's not tied into the motive of the self structure that is not that is um, based on separation so for example 
if all of that is built into a sort of habit structure, the self is actually a habit of thinking, a way of thinking. Um, if that structure starts to break down, then we lose our functionality. But if we are able to uh, act based on perception in the moment, then if we get up in the day and we walk out of our room and our bathroom's there, we know to shower. It's based on perception in the moment. And I think the structure of the brain is trying to change to be housed more based on perception action and less based on habits of the self. And I just saw the guy who says that he sees Bigfoot in this park. And so I'm walking the other trail. Mainly because I don't feel like having that conversation right now. And it made me think of how our inner subjectivity is so different and how we want to share that inner subjectivity with others. Like he'll want to tell me about Bigfoot or something. And there's nothing wrong with that. I took a survey yesterday online for somebody who's doing a study on spiritual emergency and one of the check boxes was, have you ever seen a Bigfoot or a Yeti? Or something like that. So it's part of that process. I personally have not seen Bigfoot yet. <gasps> Just kidding. Um, still haven't seen Bigfoot. So it's not necessarily a problem, he just has this very intense energy. Funny enough, he's wearing a jersey with the number that I used to use in elementary school and quite a few sports. So it's like a sign or a synchronicity, but you know, we're walking around physically in the same park, but we have very different inner stories going on. And um, his inner story is very different in detail, but he's experiencing some urge to share what he's seen and believes and things like that. And I think I saw him in the park yesterday too. And then when I was driving, I did a couple of laps of driving before I went home. I think I saw him riding a bike in the dark. Um, so then that's when I was like, yeah, that was him. So he's here pretty much every day, probably looking for the big feet or foots. Again, nothing wrong with that, but he's pretty intense. And I have my own memes to process of my own inner subjectivity, so. And I've noticed that it's getting darker a lot earlier. So I won't have much time to walk before I have to go home. It's still smoky. And last night, I had a terrible dream. I felt somebody, it felt like arms were coming through my bed and I was laying on my back and there's somebody like shoving their fingers in my armpits and like right here and like I was trying my hardest to get away and it was just grabbing me. And I felt like me trying to get away was the same force that I was trying to use to wake up. I knew I needed to wake up in order to get away from that sensation. So is that not symbolic or what? Sometimes I feel like this awakening process, there's this energy that wants to drag one back. And if I wasn't taking the sleeping pills, or if I weren't taking the sleeping pills, I still don't know was or were, where, whatever. Um, then I'd probably be in psychosis while awake, but I'm able to sleep, but there's still these elements, even in sleep, you know, and that's why sometimes Zoplicone and other sleeping pills can cause bad dreams, because there's this kind of like negative force that wants to stop it from happening. And it was trying to get at me in my dreams. And it could be a sign too that I've been taking the Zoplicone for too long. So I'm going to try to 
I'm gonna up the trazodone a bit tonight and then I'll decrease the zoplicone a bit to maybe a quarter the night after and see what happens. this light it looks really cool whoa it's like playing the strings it's just coming through the sunroof it feels like playing a harp or something this is the stuff that happens when I start to shift into the more positive space calling it more positive isn't really an accurate description And I'm waiting to go into my counseling appointment. And the company I had left yes oh today sometime, so back to a normal routine, I guess. And it's August 16th, so half the month of August is already gone. I'll probably leave for California on on September 28th. So I just have a bit over a month to go, so that's not too bad. And I bought a bag of high chews because I really like these right now. I'm eating super unhealthy. I had, I ate a whole small pizza yesterday, and yeah, just eating candy and unhealthy stuff. And um, I'm okay with that right now because it's sort of congruent and and equivalent to taking all these psych meds that I'm taking right now. Last night I managed, I took um, 125 milligrams of trazodone, uh, 125 of quetiapine. I took a gravel suppository, somebody told me about this, and I replaced the Benadryl with that. But taking two Benadryl is actually cheaper than a gravel suppository. But I'm pretty sure this Nausanan medication that I got, I didn't get Nausanan, I got a um, generic version, which I don't care. It's called Methoprazine. Five milligrams, so I can take half a tablet at night as needed. And they gave me the, the blurb about it. And the doctor, or the pharmacist said I shouldn't really have any bad reactions to it per se though I've never taken a like a promazine type drug so who knows and um, I think I remember reading online that it's not great to take um, oh yeah allergy medications well, I think just because it could make you even more sleepy. So I might give it a try just to see how it works so that way I can um, talk to my doctor about it next time I'm there. And also getting a break from the Zoplicone would be good. Last night I took a third of a Zoplicone. I didn't take a half, I took a third. So I might do a third again tonight or maybe I'll try this half of a whatever this is just to give it a try, see what the difference is and see if it makes a good switch from cold turkeying onto this one instead of the Zoplicone. And trying this too will be good because if it doesn't work very well then I We'll move on to trying something like CBD oil, which I'll get when I cross the border, probably. It's getting too hot in this car, even though this is really nice. I'm going to get out. Yesterday, I went to Value Village and I bought a bunch of books and a few DVDs, which I never do. Which is probably a sign also that I'm switching into happy mode because I don't know whether it's salience or not. Because, for example, if I'm not in a happy mode, if I'm not on the manic side of things, I'll go to Value Village and there'll be no books that I like. 
And I, there's no books that I like. But yesterday when I went, being in a more happy mode, I probably bought like 10 books. Even though I don't really have a ton of time to read, um, I'm going to try to read some of them. But I feel like at some point, um, like maybe when I get back, if I come back and get settled with whatever, reading some books and, and talking about them, like extrapolating them as I read them. Because I often have extrapolations in mind when I do read books, but unless I have a proper process of doing that onto video or writing a book, I think doing it on video would be easier because writing a book is like having to put it in a, a logical order that makes sense. Whereas if it's a conversation with oneself, then it's a conversation. So I got some good books. I'll talk about them later because I don't have them here with me. And one DVD I got was this and it's, I've never seen it and I'm going to a friend's house to watch a movie tonight. So he might already have this, but this is like the two disc special edition it's not even open and I think this is what might have set off the London drugs alarm at the door when I went in I got it at value village but the alarm went off and it's probably because this was stolen and it was never demagnetized I wouldn't be surprised about that and then I went out and it beeped again but they didn't really make me stop they're like oh the beep when you came in so if they would have thought I stole something if they had this there they might have thought I stole it. I doubt they have this there, but on the off chance, I'd be like, hey, you stole this. When I got it at Valley Village yesterday, and it's in my bag because I'm going to see a movie with a friend, they would have Blu-ray anyway, maybe not DVD, but maybe they would. I don't know. And then I also got this movie because of the title. And um, it's called, well, the first one is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And the other one is the last time I committed suicide. And yeah, I don't know what it's about at all, but it could be interesting. And then the other book that I, or the other DVD I bought was a movie about Kinsey, who is the guy who created the Kinsey scale which has to do with sexuality. So I didn't bring that one because I'll probably just watch it on my own. Um, I don't, I know the Kinsey scale is something to do with being gay or straight. I don't know if it includes whole, the whole transgender thing or not, or not, but we'll see how that arose. And it's kind of interesting because it's a movie about a researcher again, and I watched on Netflix a movie about the Milgram experiments and that researcher Milgram and that was interesting it was to do with people who were willing to shock other people because the people were saying hey you got to do this for the research and um, like 65% of people went all the way to the end of the shocks even though the guy was no longer making noise or responding on the other side of the wall so yeah, it's how it makes sense. We're mostly conditioned to do what we're told by perceived authority, which extrapolates to mental health. We do what we're told according to the perceived authority of the mental health system, you know, dressed up in their scientific coats and everything. And I'm not necessarily against that anymore, but um, I see it as, as something that we can outgrow. And that's a hopeful thing. Imagine if we're told when we get diagnosed, hey, you'll outgrow this whole system. And I guess that's what they want too, because now they're, they're closing people's files at mental health and just having the GPs prescribe medication. And so they don't want us to be a part of the whole hospitalization, acute care, being transferred to community mental health, uh, they want us to just take our meds from our GP and go on with life. And I don't fully agree with that because I'm going to um, take the meds to 
get to California and then probably try to lessen them again and prove to myself that in a beautiful environment that I really enjoy, I probably don't need very many medications. And and creating the lifestyle of being a snow chick, which is something that I have wanted for a long time. And there's other levels to that, which I'm learning from Steve Pavlina. Um, and I'll talk about that later. Well, the other levels he talks about as tools, which I'll go back, I'll go into more later. He mentioned number one, which is like money in terms of abundance. And then number two is having an abundant lifestyle. And that's what I've been working on with myself is having the lifestyle that I want, despite the fact that I've been diagnosed bipolar. So being able to go on a trip for an extended period of time might be hard for somebody who has that label and I'm trying to do that. Have an abundant lifestyle and that gives me hope to keep going even in the times when um, some other energy comes in and, and makes life really challenging. And that's something that switched by taking this class with him every day is now I'm sort of curious about challenges whereas before I would shy away from them like con like a parent conflict or something with other people and then the next level he talked about was the level of creating a good story or sculpting one's character and I see um, sculpting one's character as possibly something to do with embodying one's mania and then creating a good story uh, for me might be well creating some of the stuff that I was told to create in my very first so-called mania or altered state, like the dream center. So it would make a good story if I was able to create that when it was basically a so-called delusional state. So moving towards creating that, even if it is what I was talking about before, um, awakening the dream center in the brain. Um, so we, we move a lot based on cognition of a separate self which is conditioned so my thing that I'm I'm seeing and I don't know if it's my job to really like research it or anything but I'm seeing as a hypothesis as a possibility that it's not necessarily going to work for us to try to function again based on executive function of the prefrontal cortex and precognition and conditioning because part of the this thing that happens in mental health crisis is we get we get deconditioned in a way and all that we use to function is sort of taken away from us because all of it is innervated in a matrix of a self that isn't there so if if all the cognitive functioning and thinking is based on this presupposition that we have this separate entity of a self inside of us acting autonomously then when this deconditioning of that falls apart then all of our functioning falls apart because it's all tied together um, but for me you know we have a whole huge other area of the brain that we can use and I think it could be you know I could call it the dream center instead of say the, the prefrontal cortex area um, it wouldn't even be a center it would be the dreaming capacity, dreaming while wide awake, living one's dreams while wide awake, as opposed to um, living like a drone. So that would be a good story, and that would be something that would build, you know, quote, my character. Um, and I've seen what my character could be as how I was in so-called mania, so embodying one's mania. So maybe I have talked about that, to some degree um, the good story sometimes I think parts of my story are really bad but they could end up being blessings in disguise so I'm starting to see that um, like it could be memorable that somebody talks to themselves for you know 600 to a thousand videos right now I think I'm at 650 but and I'm doing longer ones so the number doesn't really matter but I did a rough calculation that I've probably spoken close to two million words to myself like this over about 250 hours so I'm still going and I still have a ways to go because um, 
I'm looking for a certain result. So if I publish whatever before I get a certain result, then I don't think it's as powerful. So the next thing I'm doing is, well, maybe not coming back. I'll be coming back, but in a different way. And um, so creating good story. And then the next level he talked about was relationship with the universe or nature of reality. And what's interesting about this is I realized that that's what I've been doing this whole time is exploring the nature of reality, of so-called bipolar reality, um, with myself, with the universe, you know, talking with the universe in dialogue or whatever. So he talks about those different sort of lenses for looking at abundance. And I might not have an abundance of money, but I have an abundance of an ability to explore the nature of reality and my relationship with the universe. So that top level that he's talked about, I don't know if it's a top level, it's just a level, um, I'm creating something based on an abundance of that, which is these videos, and hopefully these videos show a story. It's going to be a pretty kind of slowly unfolding one, um, but maybe my physical story doesn't matter as much as creating this relationship with the universe um, and helping other people to see things like this. So I'm going to check the time because it might be my appointment. taking for supplements and meds. Got my lithium orotate, sunflower lecithin, zinc, glycinate, melatonin, oh, and the thiopine. These are both trazodone, even though they look different, and so is that. And about a third of Zoplicone. And today I ordered more supplements on VitaCost. I used to use this to hold the phone up and balance it and it just broke. This part here. Hmm. Time for something new. Posted the seven S's of co creation on my wall, as well as acts of kindness, which were there before, and this is the scale of consciousness. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I just want to quickly tell myself what books I got at Value Village and why. I got Me to Eat Finding Meaning in a Material World. says, choose your issue, do your research, build your team. I need to build a team. Call the first meeting, make a plan of action, take action, have fun. So I'm thinking that when I get back from California, I'm going to do a bunch of reading. And I got a book on the psoas muscle. These were all at Valley Village. Very important to strengthen your psoas muscle. I learned about that a couple years ago. Um, this is probably kind of fluffy, but it's Think and Grow Rich for Women. And I like it because it talks about creating a mastermind group. And that's sort of what I want to do is create some kind of group of brilliant bipolar brains. Oh, that's kind of a good meme. Brilliant polar brains and I got this Doctoring the Mind by Richard Bentel Why, Psychi Why Psychiatric Treatments Fail and I flipped through it and at the end it talks a lot about CBT I don't think CBT is the ultimate answer but This will be a good book. And I got 
this book is more about in the workplace accessing group wisdom in the workplace well the universe is our workplace as bipolar people and I just found that this book has really good questions it has objective questions reflective questions interpretive questions decisional questions and evaluating the process of a project um, where has the work gone easy what could blah 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 so there's just so many different questions and I like questions so I got this book yeah it's just kind of really good for projects and at some point when I have a team or a mastermind group, when we have a team, me to we, then that could be helpful. And then this one is take more action, how to change the world. I've recently realized, hey, wait a minute. Same authors, the same person probably donated the book. I've recently realized that I think as a person who experiences mania, it's not super great to act. I think we gotta get the memes down. Like if you think of cognitive behavioral therapy, I created something else, like a different acronym, something meaning dialogue. We have to get the dialogue and the meaning going and that will change the whole field and will change all our behaviors instead of trying to fit back into the box. This is a really old receipt. Where's the date? Oh, 12-22-2011, before Christmas. That was the year that I was uh, hospitalized. Interesting. A receipt for this book it was $50 and I got it for $5.99 this receipt is really faint so yeah that's a good deal and it talks about people who take action but and different things but yeah so eventually I think when there's a team of people, we can take some more action. I think in Mania, we try to take a lot of action, and because of our actions, we get captured and reprogrammed back to thinking that we're a separate me, when really we are a we. We are one humanity. And then, this was interesting, you are what you say. And I'm still waiting to find out when that documentary, You Are What You Act, will be out. I have no idea, but proven program that uses the power of language to combat stress, anger, and depression. And this will be interesting for me because I've done this myself. I've sort of talked to myself so much that I have my own context of meaning that I've created for myself and that acts as a buffer to the memes that would have me uh, feel like I am a mental patient or um, I can't work to understand myself and I have to rely on what other people have told me to think about myself and when I think about myself in those ways I don't learn I don't understand myself and then I just end up afraid of every little thing that could be called a symptom so um, yeah it's could be Kind of interesting. What does this say? Discovering language. It talks about Helen Keller. So I'm going to read that at some point. And this one is One Great Insight is Worth a Thousand Good Ideas. So at some point, I'd like to figure out what insights 
or ideas that I have might be valuable in some way to maybe manifest abundance. So it's possible that this could provide some clues. And the last one was, I had to get this one for sure, because this is the lady, Carol Dweck, who I watched a video, I don't think it was a TED talk, and she talked about mindset, which is growth mindset versus, I still can't remember what it was, like static or I don't know, it doesn't say in here, but static mindset or fixed, I think it's fixed mindset. So I would say growth for sure. So yeah, I'm going to read those at some point. And today I watched the movie The Last Time I Committed Suicide. And it had some actor dude and some actress lady and Keanu Reeves. Who actually wasn't the main person. I didn't know anything about this movie, but it was about a man named Neil Cassidy, who I knew nothing about watching the whole movie until the end, when I googled him and he was a part of the Beat Generation, which I had no idea what that was until I read a bit of the wiki. And it was something about the post-World War II era when people started writing in a certain way that broke down the literary way that was very structured and couldn't be broken, so they broke it. And what was interesting in this movie is the guy, the main character, who played Neil Cassidy, who that's who it was supposed to be, acted like a crazy manic the whole time. I think he was manic for like 20 years and then died. And he was part of the psychedelic movement in the 60s. He died in the early or late 60s or something. But this guy is seen as sort of a uh, cultural hero in a way. And he didn't really publish anything. But if you go on the wiki page of Neil Cassidy and you go to the literary section, um... If you read what the little blurb is there, it's just like manic babble. So it almost seems to me like these people who got access to this sort of, they even said in the wiki article, if you look in the wiki article of Neil Cassidy and also Beat Generation, you'll find a bunch of clues. And it says in the wiki page that he was sort of writing like stream of conscious manic. They even use the word manic. So it seems like people after the after World War II started writing in these ways and being like counterculture and reading Neil Cassidy's thing, it said he was in relationships with men too. It didn't point to this in the movie, but he was bisexual obviously and seemed hypersexual in the movie and just going up against all the social norms and breaking those open. And that's sort of what like a manic does. But now, if somebody was to behave like that now, they have a big psychiatric system to capture that person into and just say, you're nuts. So, um, yeah, there's a lot more to it. I would say watch the movie. It's not, I wouldn't say it's the greatest movie, but it's interesting. And then I don't have time to go into it and extrapolate it too much. But if you read the Neil Cassidy wiki as well as beat generation then you'll see the clues read the writing that he did it's totally manic and i don't mean that in a pathological way i just mean that in like a stream of consciousness creative type way and he was that way and now there's a place for people like that to go and um yeah i have a lot to talk about right now but i don't have the time I'm finding myself, if I have a chance to hang out with someone, I do that. And I'll talk to myself later. So it doesn't really have the same energy later. But I think by now, uh, maybe I won't really talk about stuff as much. And, and I'll point to the clues more. Like, hey, there's a clue in this. Because I feel like 
um, just demonstrating how a brain can find subjective meaning for oneself and harvest it and extrapolate it to how one's own subjectivity and brain algorithm is working in order to see that it's not really, it's not pathological. It's, I'm seeing that subjectivity goes between like a historical way where people, where one is interacting with people who are wanting to talk about the past. And then there's this other way that's more creational it's more creative that is like not even thinking about the past and is in the present and perception is creative in that when one perceives something one also can at times harvest meaning from that that one creates subjectively and is fascinating or one can maybe look at something and then perceive beauty like in a colorful dead leaf or um, perceive the potential um, gesture of generosity or what have you there's a lot more energy in that so I have more to talk about on that later but for now I need to go to sleep take all these pills oh yeah this is I didn't talk about this this is taurine and I lately I haven't been able to swallow it at night so I put it in a bit of water. It doesn't really taste like anything. I just empty the caps into water and I drink it and it doesn't taste like anything, so it's fine. I could have ordered taurine powder now that I think about it, but I forgot. But I do have the caps in the morning. So I did order supplements today from Vitacost. Um, I was only gonna order, say, 100 bucks worth because I didn't have any coupon. But since I go through a website called Giving Assistant, they do 4% cash back through VitaCost. I keep forgetting to pay with PayPal. I think you don't have to pay with PayPal, but I paid with my credit card. I ended up ordering $160 worth because I got, or $180, because I found a coupon for $30 off, $180. So that's almost... That's a bit more than 15%. So that's good. And so I paid about 150 plus a bit of tax and I got quite a few things. I took a screen recording of what I got. And it's pretty much adding up to quite a bit. But I'm going to keep going with it until I'm in California and then I'm going to reduce not only the meds, but the vitamins. I might even try to go back on hearty nutritionals for a few months because it's a lot easier system. And also I remember hearty nutritionals, they said, don't take different, amount, different amounts of minerals, but you can do more vitamins and amino acids. So I might be able to do a modified version of that in order to use some of those up. And yeah, so I'm gonna keep going with it. I feel like from what I've learned that the environment is a lot more important and when one gets that right and feels safe and relaxed and in a good vibe then um, one doesn't really need as many meds I don't think. And I have it in my calendar that yesterday marks eight and a half months on the balancing brain chemistry supplements and you know I'm still having to take quite a few meds but it could be that taking all these supplements is what is making it so I don't really have any side effects from these meds. I don't feel off during the day or anything. I feel completely fine and normal during the day. And um, I did have some anger for a while, but I think I'm coming out of that. And that's why I have more energy. And um, I've been thinking about that cycle a little bit differently. Like now that I'm on the up cycle this time, I'm not going to lay around because I laid around probably on the up cycle last time and then I've been kind of taking it easy and going with the flow and hanging out and being social during the three months of not so good time. So the three months of not so good actually wasn't that bad because of the way I strategized. So now um, I'm not going to go crazy with the energy. I'm still going to try to sleep as much as I can, but I might, um, I'll talk to myself more for sure to show the difference and uh, talk about it in different ways because I've learned some more things and 
more in the books. There's so much to talk about. And I'm glad I'm taking the Steve Pavlina Abundance course because he talked about those levels and the level of the nature of reality and relationship with the universe. That's sort of what I do for bipolar. And at some point, I won't use that word anymore. But right now, it's a helpful bridge for other people who might function like this but have been thinking of themselves in terms of someone who's mentally ill and I don't think that's true I think there's a mental shift going on and uh, so many things and um, yeah I think learning how to use the brain differently not with the self and I was thinking a little bit about near-death experiences how people say oh I was watching myself like in a crisis like that the self isn't needed it's actually an impediment but then we think oh it's so special like there was no self there and everything was kind of light and wonderful even though it was a crisis that can happen we can experience life that way when we're not in crisis the thing is that we're always operating with the self and it doesn't have to operate and the more we can learn to operate without it the better because the universe is taking it out in terms of um, autism alzheimer's um, mental health crisis that results in non-functioning well if we learn to function with the other areas of our brain that aren't this little bitty seat of the self then we will be just fine and I think more than fine and that's what I want to possibly explore in the next six months or so or eight months and hopefully it will be a fun ride. <laughs>